Welcome back to Golden Rule Radio, your weekly recap of the precious metals markets. Miles and Tori here with you today to uh, recap not only this week, but a little bit of January. And so without further ado, not a whole lot of exciting price action in the metals. I mean, gold was down 1% in January, silver down 3.5% in January, platinum 7.4%, and finally continuing its downtrend, palladium was off another 12%. In January, on top of a 37.5% decline in 2023. So it's the one to watch here as the downtrend continues. But, Miles, anything to point out just in terms of a simple monthly summary? Nope. Great show, Tori. No, I think the consolidation <laughs> in gold was obviously expected given the recent run up and putting in another all time high back at the beginning of December. So I remain not miffed by any means, but certainly just hesitantly waiting to see what kind of decision gold wants to make. I mean, when you look at gold compared to some of the other white metals I want to look at, which both still look like they're leaning bearish, gold just keeps kind of making me feel like it wants to remain bullish and really doesn't want to take that step back I've been hoping for, which means as soon as I start getting optimistic, we're going to get a $40 drop in gold. (laughs) It'll go down to 1980, which I would love to see happen. I would too. Me sticking to my guns often is the correct choice. I'm just, like a lot of people, too impatient to do so. Yeah, gold remains in this consolidation phase. I like that it's building a pennant sideways triangle here. We're going to run out of runway one way or the other. So I think we are going to see some moves exceeding the current trading range. I mean, your short-term trading range in gold is like 2025 to like 2050. And it's almost nothing. It's remarkable. Yeah, it's real tight. Yeah. I mean, here we are sitting today. We're 2037 as we record, and that's where we were yesterday. But it's a really strong level. I mean, when you look at the recent U.S. dollar, call it a pop or whatever else, I mean, just a few weeks ago, we were in the 102s. Now we hit a high of 104 and a half, and it didn't do anything to the gold price. Normally, you would see gold come off, and we would get that $20 to $40 decline. But I don't think that they're going to be able to cut rates. And I think some of that is what is causing some consternation and some unknown and uncertainty is what are they going to do with rates? And gold is kind of that pure money metal on top of the geopolitical hedge, if you will. The more tension there is on the geopolitical fighting scene, the better that is for gold and not necessarily for the white metals. But man, you would think that with just those two things, the Fed hesitation on cutting rates and with what we're seeing economically across the board with commodities as a result of that, that gold could be following silver, platinum, and palladium. Yeah, Rob and I talked about this last week following the Fed announcement, but to me, it just felt like a lot of buy the rumor, sell the news in that the expectation of stagnant or declining interest rates during the election year, uh, a lot of people went into that kind of expecting to see that take place. The Dow, I know we're bouncing around charts here, so apologies, (laughs) but I think the Dow clearly looks overbought and probably turning around shortly. And the Dow even conservatively could take a 4,000 point drop, 4,500 point drop, and still be incredibly bullish. So the overextension we're looking at, not only in the equities market, but also not so much overextension in gold, but the overextension we had back in December in gold and not having much of a decline there. I really think gold is disconnecting itself, like we're talking about here from the other white metals. I think that gold is disconnecting itself from the equities market. And being that the US dollar has remained stable now, a pretty big trading range. I mean, you're talking a seven, eight percent trading range up and down, but it's been that seven or eight percent trading range for a number of months now. So yeah, gold is fascinating me. It really should come back. It's not. The white metals are. The white metals are trading much more reasonably from a charting perspective than gold is. So we'll certainly have to see, but I'm starting to get concerned that we're going to start moving into new territory in gold sooner than I'm prepared for. Yeah, I agree. And as we record, silver is at $22.27 on Wednesday afternoon. That's a further decline just from the January 3.5%. And that's actually brought us into a really fun 
91 plus gold to silver ratio that I don't know if that's going to keep continuing. I mean, the stronger gold stays and the more the white metals pull back, the higher that ratio is going to climb. And that's actually really, really good for our portfolios because the higher it is, the more indicated a ratio trade is, whether it's in an IRA or in a storage account or even possession metals, it doesn't matter. So I'm kind of cheering for this trend to continue. You know, go gold and buy buy silver for a little bit. Give us a ratio trade if we're going to be going through a market correction like this in the white metals. Well, Tori, the nice thing about a 100 to 1 gold ratio is you don't have to be greedy on the other side of that ratio trade. That's right. You know, you can look at that average in the 50s and say, let's be reasonable, let's be conservative, and let's take a 100 to 50 ratio trade instead of 100 to 30, which we haven't seen in 12 years. So there could be some good opportunity for the metals owners, not just waiting for the big moves, but catching a few moves back and forth in the meantime that we'll certainly want to be prepared for. Yeah. And silver, I think, where were we? Around $21.90? $21.90 on that low just a couple of weeks ago. So we inched back down towards that. Has anything changed technically on silver? I mean, what's your new target support level, I guess, if I were to ask? Yeah, it's the same conversation we had a few weeks ago. I mean, the trading range in silver is just gigantic. The previous high in silver going back to the beginning of December at 2590 almost, same right around May of last year, 2590, 26, same going back all the way to 2022. Yeah. On the flip side of that, we had a low in August of 22 at like 1760. And since then, we've actually been stepping our lows up. There is an argument to be made that silver is actually compressing upwards. But if you just look at silver, say over the last year, since January of last year, so let's say last 12, 14 months, you're just looking at a trading range between, oh, 20 and 26, which is significant. I mean, a $6 trading range on a $20 price tag, that's 30%, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 25. Yeah. And I loved your chart that showed the volatility of silver. I mean, that <clears throat> again speaks to the ratio and, oh, yeah. and trying to time it, but you know, you've got 10 to 15% swings in silver compared to that seven or eight percent in gold and that again is our friend in the instance that we're hoping for one of those but for the silver holder it's frustrating silver continues to break hearts it's below its all-time high by about 55 percent it's 55 percent below the 50 dollar high gold is about two and a half percent below that arguably 2080 high other than the outlier event that we had at the end of 2023 so certainly more upside potential there. I'm getting more and more questions about it. There's more and more talk out there about buying silver. Yes, it's undervalued. I don't know that it's more undervalued than platinum though, or palladium. I mean, look at palladium. It was $1,300 higher than gold, and now it's $1,100 less than the gold price. I mean, that's a huge swing too. Platinum, as we record, is right around $884, so we're back below the 900 it was down another 7.4% in January, like I said. I mean, what are you thinking there? That's surprising me that it's hanging in. Palladium's down almost 60 bucks today. Yeah. Palladium's had a significant decline. 5%. Just today, and we're going back to like 2018 pricing when we started the whole thing. Palladium has basically given up everything it did on the big massive run. I mean, I know that we went from 450 to 850 between 2016 and 2018, and that's a pretty significant move. But if you look at the charts, most of the parabolic move up occurred between 2018 and 2020. We had a massive semi head and shoulders pattern until about 2022, and then we've given it all back. So everything Palladium did to the upside is now gone, and that's a real problem if you didn't swap out of your Palladium when you had the opportunity to do so. It's a phenomenal opportunity if you were swapping out of Palladium when you had the opportunity to do so, and now you're looking at your Platinum and Palladium ratio almost back to one-to-one. -one. So I think we're almost there. Oh, 2% away. Yeah. Yeah. So whether you've been following this ratio back and forth for the last 10 years, or whether you're just looking to get involved into it here soon. So we may be at the point here where you kind of don't want to buy either. 
and you might just want to wait for the opportunity in Palladium to come up unless you're already a Platinum owner. I don't know if I'm adding to my Platinum today at one to one because I think we're about at the point where we're going to start looking here when we get down below one to one where we're looking at swapping back over to something like Palladium. If my focus is only on the Platinum to Palladium ratio, I can see your argument. But with the value of Platinum to Gold, That's a I good disagree because I still think that it's really undervalued. So we've watched that go from a 2 to 1 Gold to Platinum ratio to a 0.5 to 1 Gold to Platinum ratio <laughs> because Gold is twice the price, more than twice the price of Platinum. So the fun part about it is that you have all these different strategies if you're willing to diversify and play the long game because it's not about the spot price, it's about the ratio. I'm not trying to say that you're wrong from the standpoint of platinum coming down. Like if you look at a chart, could the price come lower? Yes. From a platinum to palladium ratio, could it improve? Absolutely. I mean, we may see two, three to one instead of just one to one. Sure. That's a good point. However, that platinum to gold piece is good. But again, yeah. diversification, small position. I tend to cap it at 10. Most of the, the company would even agree to us putting in a platinum position is about 20% in an extreme outlier event. So it's a minority position in your physical metals portfolio. Well, and that's a really good point about gold too, because if you look at platinum compared to gold, you're talking probably a historic average at about 1.3 to 1.5 times the price. So with gold at $2,000, you'd expect to see platinum somewhere between 2,800 and 3,000. But it's, like you said, less than half the price. So I guess it doesn't always have to be a straight line ratio that you're working towards. Sometimes it might make sense to have a diversified portfolio where you have a couple different options with each of the assets, right? Like a platinum position doesn't have to go into rhodium or right. palladium. It could go into gold. It could go into silver. And it doesn't take a lot of work. It just takes time. But it doesn't take a lot of work to go back and watch those perspective ratios uh, between different metals and figure out exactly what's going to be the right play when it presents itself. So that's a good point, Tori. I'm glad you brought up platinum gold. Well, and I'm trying to figure out too, I mean, it, it's so hard, Miles, like even looking at fundamentals, some of this could continue in terms of the broad-based commodities contraction. You could see an equities contraction. I mean, the S&P 500 kind of circling back around to the equities briefly. Can it push over that 5,000 threshold? It's flirting with it again, and there's certainly room to run in a rally. But same thing with the U.S. dollar. It could strengthen here with everything that you have going on throughout the rest of the world. This economic hesitancy, if you will, or uncertainty is not isolated to the United States. I mean, China and Hong Kong have erased $7 trillion in equities value since 2021. $7 trillion. Imagine if that had happened in the United States right now on top of all the debt and the spending and the interest rate hikes and everything else. Now you've got a wiping out of retirement accounts on top of an inflationary environment where people are having a hard time making ends meet. And to that point, unfortunately, you've got debt just has spiked, household debt reaching $17.5 trillion in the fourth quarter of 2023, like $212 billion spike. People are borrowing to get by. They're not borrowing to buy stuff. And so dollar strength isn't necessarily showing itself at what we're paying at the pump or in the grocery store or in our utilities. Yeah. You mentioned the S&P a second ago. I think it's worth pausing there real quick. Uh, 14 weeks. Over the last 14 weeks, how many of those 14 weeks has the S&P finished the week up? Man, at this rate in 14 weeks, I would think it'd be about 11 of them. <laughs> 13 of them. Wow. So the S&P has been on a complete tear. That's unsustainable. In fact, there isn't a more textbook example of RSI divergence and stretching out beyond, say, like the 200-day moving average and lining up your fibs. There hasn't been a more textbook example of a reasonable corrective move pending that I've seen in a chart in a long time. But here's what's scary about that. Let's say we take a really measured move back down in the S&P right now, 
Well, let's say we just decline back to the old high of July or the most recent high we put in on this climb back in July. Well, you're still talking a move like that is still like an 8% loss in the S&P. And I wouldn't even consider that a real pullback. Like, let's say we go down to the 382 FIB from where this started. You're talking an 11% loss. Just get down to very shallow correction levels. And see, what concerns me about that is, you know how far the 618 FIB would be from here? 18%. Wow. And that's still just a healthy retracement. It is. And that's actually something to count on in any environment. Yeah, so you can't tell me that the recent growth in the S&P really since over the last year, coming off that big crash through 2022, where we lost such a significant percentage, you can't tell me that the growth that we've seen hasn't been, frankly, manipulated up on whether it's been purposeful or whether it's just been banker leveraged investing. It's clearly overextended. Yeah, or Fed speak. Right? I mean, it's the Fed yeah. speak. Imagine, Miles, the bloodbath. I mean, 18% to start because don't you think a lot of this rally has been assumptive on a rate cut coming in March, which now is not going to happen, according to Powell on 60 Minutes. He says there does not appear to be a justification for a March rate cut. Maybe you're looking at a May, and I think they have to say that because they let the cat out of the bag with the rate cut conversation. All they had to do was say they weren't going to raise rates for the foreseeable future. They were pausing indefinitely, if you will. Unfortunately, the markets priced in six rate cuts was the last I heard in terms of the market <laughs> rally. And Good now, luck with now, that. now they're hoping to get one to three at some point in 2024. Numbers just aren't supporting it. And it's unfortunate that they're lying about the non-farms payroll data because that actually works against them as they try to juice the numbers to later get adjusted down, as we've talked about on this show. It actually works against the justification for cutting rates because now they can say the economy and the job market is too hot to justify it, but yet the equities markets are begging for it. Well, and here's what's crazy about that. Powell doesn't even need to cut rates. He just needs to tell people he might. That's where we are in the reality of our world. That's where we are in- right. That's the manipulation. That's what you're describing, I think. We don't even need to do a thing. People are so gaslit into this debt-driven, leverage-driven market raise that we've had over the last couple of years. You don't even need to lower rates. You just need to tell people you might. It's just straight gaslighting at this point. Yeah. Very, very true. And, you know, all markets seem to be teetering. That's the one sense I get is that we're teetering. I don't see some healthy, viable rallies, not even in the bond market. The yields aren't telling us a whole lot. The 10-year yield is now at 3.88. That's actually good for gold, which might be part of the reason gold is staying strong too, is that those yields not only quit climbing, but have reversed and continue declining. Oil's not telling us anything, hovering around 73 or 74, despite Mideast tensions. You've got about seven hot spots around the world <laughs> that we're trying to deal with. And then you've got a domestic social issue with not only financial and economic in terms of bankrupting the country, but with the immigration thing. It reminded me of the Cloward Piven strategy. So that's a political strategy outlined in 1966 by American sociologists. Well, they were also political activists, Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven. But it's basically a strategy of forcing political change so that it leads to a societal collapse. You're collapsing capitalism. And that's what all of this seems to be doing. And that's why I'm more than anything, or for any other reason, bullish on gold, because until the financial aspect of the spending and the debt and the insurmountable obligations, both short-term and long-term, that we have on top of a higher interest rate market, it screams that gold should be much higher. I don't see how we don't see $2,300 gold this year because we're amassing this massive unpayable national debt and just with the immigration stuff here, 340 million in federal COVID funds diverted to migrants in Washington state, 53 million in New York City on benefit cards for migrants, $1.2 billion Department of Education plan for federal college prep aid to illegal immigrants. Connecticut canceling medical debt for thousands, you know, which equates to hundreds of millions of dollars. 
the household debt thing I talked about, the border bill that they're talking about. You know, they're you're looking at another sixty billion to Ukraine and ten billion to Israel and twenty billion to border security and taxpayer funded lawyers for immigrants. That like their spending has no limit. And that to me is the main underlying fundamental now, more than US dollar index, more than equity market strength, more than broad based commodity picture. It's that. And what happens is a picture worsens. Sorry. I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, find your closest taxpayer and give them a hug and tell them it's going to be okay. It's going to be about four out of every 10 people that you find. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Find the closest taxpayer near to you. Give them a hug. (laughs) Tell them thank you and tell them it's going to be okay. So, uh, or better yet, find the person who does the grocery shopping in your household and apologize in advance for where pricing is probably going to go over the next few years. I don't know how many times I've had this conversation with clients here recently. It amazes me how little the government cares that interest rates are going up. Yeah. And that the debt's going up. It just amazes me. Yeah. Just, it's irrelevant. It's not going to be their problem. It's going to be their kids' problems. And it's not going to be their kids' problems because their kids probably all have government contracts through work now. So, but that's probably a discussion for a different kind of podcast. (laughs) So (laughs) I'll leave it at that. (laughs) I'll leave it at that. So that's going to do it this week again for Golden Rule Radio from Tori and I here in the studio. Thank you for joining us. If you liked what you heard, do the YouTube thing. Better yet, why not give us a call? You can speak to Tori, myself, or anybody else here. McIlvaney Precious Metals. We can be reached at 800 525-9556. You can always swing by our website at McIlvaney.com. We're on Twitter at ICA Gold or Facebook at McIlvaney Financial. Thanks for listening and have a great week.